We are on top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. My name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy. Our Impact Insights webinar series provides informational content to help organizations and individuals thrive and establish new norms during the COVID pandemic. As we continue to observe changes in various sectors, we will continue to bring you valuable knowledge and insights and do our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some of our guidelines for today's webinar. Patty, could we? Thank you. Uh, so first of all, uh, please do type your questions in the Q&A window, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. We will also leave time for an interactive Q&A. So this is where you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. So please do make sure that your mic is working. Uh, use the chat window to post your comments only, please. And as a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. We are so pleased to have our very own LMU College of Business Administration, Professor Mila Bowie. Professor Bowie earned her PhD from the University of Arkansas and her MBA from Loyola University, New Orleans. She is currently our very own Associate Professor of Marketing and teaches in both our undergraduate and graduate programs. She has professional experience in promotional marketing through NOLA.com. I wish that was my website, but it is not. And she also has business development and market research through Intralox LLC USA. Professor Bowie has published research articles at premier business journals, including Journal of Marketing, Psychology, uh, and Journal of Marketing, Psychology and Marketing, Journal of Public Policy and Marketing, Journal of Consumer Affairs, and those are just to name just a few. Her research interests include public health policy, consumer judgment and decision making, and emerging technology. Today's topic on mental health is quite timely as COVID and COVID infection spike and the potential lockdowns loom over us as we near the holidays. So without further ado, Professor Mila Bowie, over to you. Thank you, Nola. I so much appreciate it. And thank you everyone for being here. It is an honor for me to be able to talk about an area that is very much near and dear to my heart. Um, I would like to be able to share my screen at this point with everyone. Let me see. If you could um, enable screen sharing. You should be able to screen share now. Okay. Fantastic. Wonderful. Is everyone able to see my screen? Perfect. Okay. All right, so to get us started. Okay, there we go. Let me see if I can switch over. It's okay, we'll go with this. Um, no, 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 no. Let's see if I can move over. There we go, all right, much better, yep. Okay, so today, um, today's topic uh, is on um, mental health. And of course, with everything that is going on um, in the world today, um, this is a fantastic opportunity uh, for us to have open discussions um, on what it is that is affecting our world uh, and our society. And what I wanted to share with you guys today is quite a bit of uh, my work in the area. And, and I will take you back a little bit more than 15 years ago um, when I first heard of the phrase negative Nancy. So the reason why um, I definitely recall um, 
this experience of being called negative Nancy is because of course I was on the receiving end of that comment. Um, and even right now, as I talk about this experience, I can feel the sense of embarrassment, um, the shame, the guilt, um, all of the negative emotions that came with that experience. But more importantly, um, it made me incredibly curious. It made me incredibly curious about, you know, negative emotions, um, the way that we process these emotions and why it is that I was being punished for verbalizing how I felt. Um, it then obviously took me down a path, um, more like a rabbit hole, uh, <laughs> and more than 15 years later, of exploring this area of negative emotions um, and all of uh, the side effects and the outcomes um, that are associated with negative emotions. So if we take a look uh, at negative emotions, um, a lot of the areas that we are less likely to talk about um, are actually issues that we should be talking about. Um, and what I'm referring to is mental health. What I'm referring to is anxiety, uh, stress, um, depression, suicide. Um, these are all the topical areas that we are discouraged um, from talking about. And as we take a look at human history um, today, um, we have never ever been faced with um, a, a, a time when mental health is one of the biggest issues and one of the issues that is actually hurting our society, hurting the human race. Before, you know, on the human agenda, we were taking a look at war. We were taking a look at famine um, and even plagues um, that stood as the leading causes of death in our society. But today, um, today, that now sits on the sidelines uh, when we take a look at mental health and mental health issues. If we take a look at just the statistics today, uh, now more than ever before, um, mental health has become the leading topic um, at the World um, Economic Forum, at the World Economic Forum where businesses, politics uh, comes together to figure out what are the agendas, business agendas, social agendas that we have to take a look at that's affecting our world. And mental health is one of them. Among mental health, one of the leading um, side effects of mental health and one of the leading causes of mental health is anxiety, which afflicts more than 275 million people a year worldwide. And that's an increase of, you know, two to almost 7% of the population per country with a bias towards females, you know, at 170 million and males at 105 million. If we take a look at the projected cost of um, mental health uh, over the next 10 years, by 2030, we're looking at about 16 trillion is the estimation. When we take a look at the statistics with regards to adults with serious thoughts of suicide in 2020, that's over 10.3 million people. And that's an increase of 450,000 people since last year alone. And these numbers for sure are underestimations because we are not accounting for what's happening right now with COVID. And we take a look at statistics from the World Health Organization and the CDC. We're talking about 800,000 people die due to, due to suicide per year. And that's one suicide every 40 seconds. In the U.S. alone, we're talking about a 33% increase in the U.S. when you're talking about suicide. So over the last 50 years, we in the U.S., we have never had rates this high when we're talking about suicide ever before. Let alone adults, uh, we have to take a look at young adults as well, those between the ages of 12 and 17. 
those numbers are also escalating when you're talking about the number of major depressive episodes in the past year, an increase of 13%, more than 13%. That's more than 99,000, more than 99,000 young adults in the past year. And again, these are underestimations. So are these topical areas still taboo? Absolutely. But I would like to highlight some of the key research in the area that provides us with some hope. Today, I want us to take a look at the research that has been done that provides different perspectives in terms of philosophy on the motivational forces on the individual. What pushes us? What primes us to behave the way that we behave? Um, what are those drivers? I want us to take a look at the different areas of how happiness and well being is being currently defined. I want to go over with you the how of happiness, how we actually make that happen. I want to go over with you the research in the areas of neuroplasticity, habit change interventions, visualization, environmental choice architecture that has been proven to show that they are effective in combating mental health, anxiety, stress, and depression. Last but not least, beyond taking a look at environment and looking at how it is that we can create happiness, I also wanna take a look at positive emotions and how it is, it is that resilience can be built. So these are some of the key areas, but first I wanna take a look at some of the motivational forces on the individual. And we take a look at the different um, competing philosophies out there. Uh, some of you may have heard of the will to pleasure. Um, some of you, maybe the will to power and for most of us probably the will to meaning. All of these different philosophical areas, what's interesting about them is that they tend to compete with one another. They are of, of different time spans um, across different demographics when we're talking about philosophers, neurologists, and whatnot. But they bring to light very interesting perspectives as to what it is that drives the individual. So first and foremost, when we take a look at um, uh, the Freudian view of will to pleasure, we are essentially taking a look at um, the pleasure-seeking uh, philosophy. And when we take a look at the pleasure-seeking philosophy, essentially what we're looking for here is we uh, seek pleasure, we avoid pain. And at the end of the day, we are looking uh, very much so um, to consume um, anything that gives us and der we derive pleasure from. But at the same time, there are competing theories such as the will to power, Friedrich Nietzsche's work. And if we take a look at this area, much of it, um, you know, actually, when we look at it initially, uh, it comes with a very negative connotation, but, but when you start to dig into it even more so, we all have this drive, the will to power. And the will to power is essentially self-overcoming. Um, you've heard of the saying, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. Without the will to power, we wouldn't be where we are today. So that is also a driver and a need that we have as individuals. So beyond pleasure that we seek, we also seek power as a, as a natural human um, foundation um, of drivers. Last but not least, the will to meaning. Um, the will to meaning is one um, that is probably most prevalent um, in society, uh, one that you probably hear of most. Um, that is um, some of the key motivations in our lives and as to how it is that we behave has much to do with us looking for meaning or search for meaning in life. But um, Viktor Frankl, you know, he proposes that um, there's a triad uh, which works against our modern society, okay? And that produces aggression, depression, addiction. These are all the varying areas that compete with one another. When we take a look, when I say compete with one another, this is what the research shows, okay? If we, if we lack meaning in our life, 
it is naturally going to be associated with the will to power and the will to pleasure. If we don't have that, we're seeking one of one of the other two, at least, if not more. We're also seeing this in the substance abuse literature. But when meaning in life is negatively related to, to, to power, the will to power, okay, then we're going to see hostility and aggression. We see uh, evidence of materialism, workaholism, okay, these all come into play. So they start to fluctuate um, across the three spectrums of philosophy here. When we take a look at will to meaning and the research that has been found uh, in this area, um, as it relates to psychological well-being, meaning they are, it is a predictor of positive affect, so that means positive emotions, happiness, life satisfaction. It's linked to hope and optimism, particularly in the face of stress. Now there are corollary linkages to the deficit in meaning uh, as well. And when that happens, we actually see higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of suicide, uh, negative emotions such as fear, anger, shame, and sadness that comes to light. Okay. But then my question um, to everyone is this. If we take a look across these competing philosophies, the will to pleasure, the will to power, and the will to meaning, these different forces, how can happiness and well-being be attained if all three philosophies suggest that the secret to life is rather active, expansive, and formative? It is not one that you can actually capture, right? It continues to grow, right? So as such, if we take a look at these competing philosophies, what I'm actually seeing in the research is that they don't just compete with one another, they complement one another. This is what I'm finding. And what you'll see as I go through the research um, in this presentation, we'll, you will see sprinkles of these philosophies across the different um, research that has been found in terms of strategies that are, are actually effective in combating anxiety, stress, um, depression. So I want to take us. Um, I want to take us back a little bit because a lot of times we, we, when we take a look at the area of happiness and we take a look at the areas of well-being, um, we have to be able to define um, what these constructs mean, what these terminologies mean. When we refer to well-being, we are talking about what are the or the optimal psychological functioning and experiences that we can have as a human. There are two ways in which the literature takes a look at this, hedonism and eudaimonic. When we take a look at hedonism, that reflects the view that our well-being is consistent with pleasure or happiness. It fits with expectancy value approach and more so in alignment with um, the will to pleasure, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. We also, to a degree, see this fall in line with the will to power as well. Because here it is about, when we're talking about the will to power, it's about self-overcoming, right? And transforming, um, being able to accomplish the goals that we set in place. <clears throat> However, on the other end of the spectrum, when we're talking about well-being, we're also referring to eudaimonic well-being. And when we take a look at eudaimonic well-being, this actually takes a look at well-being and happiness from the perspective of how it is that we as individuals come to fulfill our true nature, right? Our true nature, who we are, the essence of who we are as a human being. And as such, it lies more so in self-actualization of the human potential, your human potential, right? This is, this is in um, eudaimonic well-being is full-fledged when we engage in activities that are consistent and congruent with our deeply held values. And this is when we are fully engaged in that moment, in that activity that then produces eudaimonic well-being. So we want to talk about happiness. We want to talk about well-being. One of the easiest ways, one of the best ways to take a look is, well, who are these people? What do we know about them? What does research tell us about them, right? This is what research tells about us, tells us about 
people who are happy, okay? They're highly social. They have stronger romantic and other social relationships than less happy people, okay? The functioning aspects that create or at least promote happiness among these individuals are strong attachments to relationships. Acquisitions of age-appropriate cognitive, so that basically means their thought, thought processes, interpersonal and coping skills, some of the things we're going to talk about today, and exposure to an environment that empowers them as a person. So environmentally architecting their world in such a way that produces well-being, whether that be hedonic well-being and or eudaimonic well-being. So this all comes together um, and set within the foundations of the different will to pleasure, will to power, will to meaning. But they're just um, operationalized a little differently. What do I mean by that? I want to go over the how of happiness. What determines happiness? What determines happiness, as you can see um, from Liebermersky um, and colleagues, 50%, 50% of what it is that determines happiness has much to do with our genes. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, our personality traits and fit towards the end of um, the presentation. But I want, I want to focus more so on um, now is on the 40%. That 40% pertains to intentional activities, which means 40%, 40 percent of the pie, when we're talking about creating happiness, deals with you. It deals with you creating activities. It deals with you rather engaging in activities and creating environments that promotes well-being. Okay, so this of course, is up to you as the individual. If we take a look at um, the happiness literature, uh, the positivity literature uh, specifically, um, positive activities, positive, positive activities, and, and this is actually coming from the positive, uh, positive activity model. This takes a look at what simple, intentional, and regular practices of behaviors um, are there that can help mimic and create a very healthy environment, a very healthy thought process, and therefore behaviors. Happiness increasing strategies, this is just to list a few um, of those um, that have been found to be effective. Writing letters, expressing gratitude, all right? Counting their blessings, performing acts of kindness, cultivating their stress, visualizing their ideal future, meditating. So while I may not have um, a lot of time here tonight, what I want to do is I want to focus in on some of the key things that I know that have been found in the literature that have, have been robust in terms of effects. Before I jump into that, one of the key things that I do want to talk about is neuroplasticity. Um, when we talk about, when I refer to neuroplasticity, we're basically talking about the plasticity of the brain. Um, and much of conventional wisdom, you know, um, in the past, um, they believe that the brain in terms of development was mostly developed, mostly developed more than 90% by the time that you are age five or six. But what we're finding more recently now um, in the neuroplasticity literature is that this is not necessarily the case. And we're finding that through self-deprivation sensory deprivation experiments. So of course here animals are being used um, to test theories here, uh, but of course in many ways they can also uh, apply to humans uh, when we test this in animals. What we're finding is that through sensory deprivation, so let me give you an example. When they run studies on, what, on rats basically and they blindfold them, what will naturally happen when they blindfold them and the rats are not able to see, what will naturally happen in the brain is a cross-model plasticity that will happen. So essentially what is happening is the part of the brain, if your eyes are being um, uh, blindfolded and you're not able to see, then what is naturally going to happen is neighboring parts of the brain will actually activate. It will actually activate to help create 
that visualization that 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 the rat isn't able to see. Right. So it shows us straight away that whenever it is um, that we uh, one of our senses are taken away, another part, at least in the brain, it will then naturally extrapolate extrapolate to that neighboring part of the brain to, to find help, to seek help, right? Um, in order to, to, to either visualize or gain that information or gain um, that perspective uh, when, when that, sense, that sensory is being taken away um, from you, okay? And what we're also seeing is that neurogenesis, that is basically the formation of new neurons and the formation of new connections in the brain. Okay, all of this, the brain is plastic. And that tells us that even though we come to learn information as younger adults or even as children, that information can be unlearned and relearned. It is truly a matter of habit. So when we take a look at the science of habit, we are taking a look at what is it in the environment that that provides a cue, what is the response to that cue and what is the reward, okay? All of which, right, is, is, is being activated in hopes that we are going to achieve whatever goal it is that we have in mind. And we continue to evaluate and reevaluate whether or not we're moving towards that goal or away from that goal. And that goal system is then operationalized through our habits. But bear in mind, through neuroplasticity, the research shows us that our habits can change. Our thought processes can change. All of that can change, okay? How, how, how do we go about that? Um, when we take a look at how it is we break bad habits and foster good habits, this is what the research shows. Critical cues, critical cues, either they have to be promoted and or eliminated right? If they are cues in the environment that triggers negative emotions or rather trigger bad habits, it is the elimination and or the removal of that cue, okay? That also, once that cue is removed, that also then creates opportunities for new habits to be formed. But in order for new habits to be formed, it has to be formed within a stable context. What do we mean by a stable context? Repetition. Repetition essentially is some of the, 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 the fundamentals as to how it is habits are formed. It has to be a repeated behavior that then becomes automatic, right? It becomes automatic and it becomes something that you no longer have to um, put so much energy and effort into doing that same behavior, okay? The habits literature also shows us the, um, that in order to continue to grow um, and for habits to become even stronger and more effective, there is the area of habit stacking. So habit stacking essentially means that, for example, um, if you wanted to make sure that uh, you, you floss every night, um, you brush your teeth because you, you weren't the skill of brushing your teeth every night and every morning is something that you learn. But that has already become a habit that is well-formed. And because that is a habit that's well-formed, it's going to be much easier to associate the habit of brushing your teeth with flossing. So stacking habits um, is one of the other ways in which people continue to grow and foster really good habits. Reward. Um, is also another key element. But what is interesting about reward is number one, intrinsic rewards obviously um, are gonna be much more effective. And number two, the rewards should be uncertain and or unexpected. Because what the research shows us is that when rewards become ex um, expected, right? And they know that, that it's coming, it no longer works as, as effectively. So, you know, it's the same idea with my daughter, for example, whenever um, she doesn't know that she's going to get a treat, she's, that behavior is more likely to be reinforced because it is a reward that is unexpected, right? And she doesn't know when she's going to get it, right? Uh, for example. Now, 
<clears throat> we take a look at the area of uh, neuroplasticity. We take a look at the areas of habit. What do we do? What can we do uh, in our environment that promotes good habits? If we take a look at vision, visualization, visualization and manifestation, what we see here, so some of you guys may, may not be familiar with vision boards. If you're not familiar with it, either ask, you know, in the Q&A in a little bit, or please look it up. Um, because this, I, I promise you, is one of the most effective tools out there, visualization and manifestation. But what I'm going to go into is how it effectively works, okay? Visual images, they essentially provide you with a taste of the future. But the research shows us this. It has to be picture-like. It has to be ones that you can visually see, feel, touch. It has to be one where you yourself can identify with that goal, with that vision. It cannot be one that came from mom or dad or friend. Okay, it has to be truly yours. It has to be positive and it has to reflect something in the future, in the long term. So those are some of the key elements uh, when we take a look at visionary images that are, are effective. What I wanna go into a little bit, not too much time, is how it works and why it is effective. When we take a look at visionary images, we have to take a look at implicit and explicit motivation. There are the two dual systems that exist um for us as we go to process information they are completely different but when we take a look at the drivers and motivation we want to focus more so on implicit motives because those are are much more enduring and they're much more long term but what research shows us is this implicit motivation systems prefer nonverbal incentives it prefers nonverbal incentives what do i mean by that I mean, not words, right? Not directives, but rather our implicit motivation system, it relies more so on visual images, photographs, movies, videos, things of that nature. Research shows us that when um, these images uh, are imagined, it promotes motivation, it promotes effort, it promotes persistence. The reason why, the reason why is this, there's a mental contrasting effect that happens and that is you're able to see the, your ideal self versus the current self, the actual self. And when that contrast is then created, that then triggers the effort. It then triggers the persistence. It then triggers the motivation. And that is why. Now, we take a look at all these things, but then we also wanna take a look at, even if we were to try to change our habits, even if we were to try to um, visualize what our future may look like, we also wanna take a look at our environment. And what I wanna talk about here is choice architecture. Um, choice architecture is one of the areas, it's a, a, it's a massive literature, um, that goes into nudges, priming effects, uh, saliency. But what the key takeaway from this is as such, we as individuals have a limited capacity for how it is that we process information, a limited capacity. So believe it or not, we may not wanna hear this, but throughout the day, we, we basically operate at maybe 40%, maybe 40% when we are talking about being in the moment, being actively engaged. Um, I mean, I'll just give you a very simple example. How many of you guys go through, you know, day-to-day, uh, -day, sometimes you're reading material and you've read the whole thing and then you have no idea what it is that you're, what is it you just read, right? So obviously we can do a little bit better than this, 40%. Okay, that's what research shows us. But if we take a look at choice architecture and how it is that we architect our environment, this goes into the areas of nudging, the research on nudging. And when we take a look at nudging, essentially what we're doing is we are modifying our environment in very little ways that influences the way that we behave without actually changing any uh, economic incentive, okay? 
So we're altering our environment in subtle ways and it, it can uh, impact us consciously as well as subconsciously. But as, uh, you know, as I mentioned, if we're operating at about 40% throughout the day uh, in terms of our processing and actually being in the moment um, of active uh, awareness, we can probably use a little help when you're talking about choice architecture and nudging. Now, what is it in the literature um, that has been robust? Primes and salience. I wanna talk about these two areas, primes. So primes are essentially subconscious cues in, in our environment. It primes us, right? It triggers us essentially uh, to behave in a certain way, okay? Um, what it also, the literature, what also the research shows is that when you're taking a look at the prime manipulations in your environment, obviously it has to be visible. It has to be visible, it has to be accessible, it has to be available. That is one of the reasons why I always have a fresh bowl of fruits on the island for the kids and I, because it is, it is visually salient, it is right there. It's easy, it's convenient for you know, the kids and I to go to, and it's, it's available, right? The other, uh, the other category when we're talking about nudging, salience. Salience refers to how relevant is that information to you, right? How relevant is that information to you in influencing your behavior, okay? So a lot of times um, what I find, um, and it's very, very interesting in this area, um, I'll just use an example. Most of us have health goals that we are looking to achieve on a daily basis right? So we naturally will seek out relevant information that allows us to make very quick snap decisions to make healthier decisions, whether we're, whether we're relying on labels, um, on packages uh, that we, we go to buy, um, whether it is that the way that, uh, believe it or not, uh, the way that uh, we buy the sizes of our forks, the sizes of our plates. I intentionally buy smaller plates, and um, because also, you know, there are research that also, you know, shows us that the bigger, the larger the size of the plate, the more that you're going to to add on. Um, there's an entire literature on partitioning effects, um, and how um, partitions can work for you, and then at the same time against you. Why? Because pleasure principle. Um, you may, you know, there's research that talks about, you know, smaller size package candies that we see. Um, the only problem is when we see smaller size package candies, what we'll do is, well, we, that basically gives us the license to overconsume because, you know, why am I going to have one when I can have like three, right? For example, okay. But what is it um, that is relevant to our goals? Um, what are we seeking? Okay. So the key takeaway here is when you're talking about nudging, the most effective forms of nudging is when, in fact, you put prime nudges with salience nudges. The combination of the two together is the most effective, okay? So it has to be visible, it has to be accessible, it has to be available, but it has to be also be relevant to your goals. So the combination of the two, research has found um, that that specific category, that intersection is the most effective when you're talking about changing behavior, okay? So now we've talked about all of the environmental um, influences that can contribute to decision making and well being. What I want to spend a little bit of time on now is on the psychological uh, side, the personality trait side. Okay, so while um, research shows that about 50% of our decision making and what contributes to happiness and well being. Um, is um, dependent on uh, your genetic makeup, I wanna go over the resilience literature with you guys, okay? Because the resilience literature, resilience is um, a muscle that can be built, just like, just like when we talk about neuroplasticity and the brain and how the brain is plastic and that essentially is a muscle that can be built, resilience, psychological resilience can be built over time, okay? Um, when we're talking about psychological resilience, we're talking about how effective our coping mechanisms are in terms of adapting um, to negative experiences in our life, you know, loss, hardship, adversities, things of that nature, okay? 
I want to go over how it is um, that resilient individuals behave. Um, if you take a look at their personalities, um, it's a choice, right? It's a choice in terms of how people respond, okay? But what we find in research is that resilient individuals, they tend to be very zestful, energetic people um, when it comes to life, okay? They are curious. They are open to new experiences. They are characterized by very high positive emotionality, okay? What do they use in order to cultivate these positive emotions? They use humor, all right, they use humor. They think very optimistically. There are relaxation techniques that they use uh, when they are stressed. What has research found about resiliency? Resil resiliency and positive emotion tends to go together. And as such, it buffers against stress, right? And therefore, anxiety, as well as later on the line, depression. If we take a look at these positive coping uh, mechanism and strategies, it tends to be related to, of course, pro the promotion of positive affect, the promotion of positive emotions. It increases psychological well-being and health. So all in all, what we're seeing is that positive emotionality, that the positive emotionality that emerges or what is being cultivated is obviously highly, highly correlated with building psychological resilience, okay? So it can actually be built. But without, you know, I, I do wanna give you, a, 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 you know, some background as to how it is built. If we take a look at um, Fredrickson's uh, work, uh, Broughton Build Theory, essentially what it says here is that um, our emotions, whether positive or negative, it spirals and it builds upon each other. So one positive emotion to the second positive emotion, the third positive emotion, you actually naturally start to spiral upwards, okay? But when we're talking about negative emotions, one negative emotions, if you do not actually stop that negative emotion from, you know, from taking off, the second negative emotion compounds, the third negative emotion compounds, and then you spiral down, okay? If you take a look at resilient people, they have the ability to look at positive emotions more so. They, and as such, they're able to bounce back from the setbacks of life more easily. They're able to cope more effectively. Why? Because they're taking a look at building and, and spiraling upwards because of that positive emotionality that they're trying to cultivate, right? So that optimism totally helps. It totally works. Positivity totally works, right? That is what it is that we are learning here, okay? So now, well, we want to, we, we can talk about, you know, positive people all the time, you know, they're nice and bubbly, but what about those who are not as bubbly, right? Um, when we take a look at folks with lower levels of psychological resilience, what have we learned? Can they actually go the other way and spiral up? And research shows us absolutely. Positive appraisal, when an individual, rather than negatively appraising a situation, turns and appraises it in a very positive way, right? Finding that silver lining, it generates positive emotion. It generates that positive emotion that allows them to regulate that negative emotion, okay? And therefore, it then allows them to start coping, okay? Also, what then to happen is that the, that broadening effect um, also allows that, literally, you, you can imagine, visualize it, if that broadening effect, right? What it will naturally allow is for the individual to find then positive meaning, to find positive meaning from a situation that may initially not look as if it was that great of a situation. So what naturally then happens is a reciprocal effect uh, happens here where meaning and positive emotion feed off of one another, right? And so therefore then that reciprocity then actually helps to build that psychological resource and that being resilience. That is how resilience is built, okay? 
So to take us back <clears throat> to being called negative Nancy one day uh, as an undergraduate student, um, it obviously made me um, curious enough to go down this path. Um, and I would definitely have to say that it is so important that we fully experience, not just fully experience um, what is to happen to us as human beings, um, but negative emotions is negative emotions, sadness, stress, anxiety, and even depression is a natural part of the human experience. It's a natural part of the human experience that we need to fully understand that we need to talk about. Um, and negative Nancy, I realize, is a form of vulnerability. And when I mentioned in the beginning that I, I still to this day, you know, um, recall that sense of shame, um, that sense of guilt, um, I feel that that had so much to do with being vulnerable uh, enough to explore these emotions. And Brene Brown, um, she puts it best. If we take a look at vulnerability, it serves as the core of our emotions and of our feelings, right? To feel is to be vulnerable. And to believe vulnerability is a weakness is to believe that feeling is a weakness. Much of that rejection of vulnerability, what we don't want to talk about, which spurs from shame, um, stems from grief, sadness, negative emotions, disappointment, all the things that we definitely need to have conversations about, uh, particularly now with what's going on um, in the world, because it affects the way that we live, it affects the way that we work, it affects the way um, that we love, it affects the way that we lead. Um, and when we take a look at vulnerability, it serves as the cradle of all of our emotions. And it is these emotional experiences that we actually crave, because that is essentially the birthplace of creativity. And I can definitely assure you that had I not been called negative Nancy that day, I probably would not be sitting here having this conversation with you right now, right? It's a, it's a birthplace of love belonging, joy, courage, and empathy. So um, I urge um, you and everyone to open up about the topic of sadness, um, stress, anxiety, depression, suicide. These are all topical areas that need um, to be discussed these are conversations that need to be had because as you can see from the current statistics, which are definitely underestimations, as you know, given what's going on today, um, we clearly need to have this conversation. So I thank you for being here with me tonight um, and having this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Bowie. That was a really great talk and just so much information. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, uh, please do type in your questions in the Q&A. You're also welcome to raise your hand if you would like to directly engage with Professor Bowie. I highly encourage you to do so. Um, we do have, I, I have my own question, but I'll start with a question from Marky. Um, well, thank, first, thank you for sharing these great research findings. Uh, do you have any recommendations for parents and educators to help foster resiliency in adolescents and young adults that struggle with anxiety and negative self-talk? Oh, thank you. That is a fantastic question, Nola. I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I urge folks to do is to, to read, to read up on this literature. Um, I can tell you a great deal about it um, off the top of my head. Um, but much of resilience is actually built through positivity, right? Um, there's an entire area on positive psychology. If you, if you look into that area, positive psychology, you can take a look at uh, Martin Seligman's work. You can take a look at Barbara Fredrickson's work. Um, but quite a bit of that goes into uh, the research and the effects of positive thinking, right? And positive self-talk. 
Okay. Um, I would also say um, that once we once you're able to see the linkage between uh, the positivity of the literature and resilience, then you will see that resilience is actually built through positive a positive mindset. And a positive mindset is a growth mindset, right? That negative self-talk is the exact opposite. It essentially, it, 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 it narrows in, uh, in terms of uh, your sense of creativity. It narrows down in terms of your sense of openness to any alternative or any different viewpoints or opinions, or even learning about different ways in which, um, uh, in which can help you out of, of, of tough situations. So to build resilience, it has so much to do with positivity, positivity, positivity. So that positivity self-talk, you know, finding that silver lining um, in any type of situation, that is key if we're talking about building resilience. And, and that's in different aspects of life, whether it be through sports with their kids, whether that be through academics, always, right? Being able to reframe, to reframe the mind. And in some ways it has to do with reframing the terminology that you're also using on a daily basis, right? Focusing more so on positive. Great, thank you. And um, another question from the audience, what are some actionable ways you can speak, um, ways you can speak about mental illness where your culture and environment may see mental illness as negative? That is a fantastic question. Um, you know, we really, while I gave you, you guys, a story, um, that story is deeply rooted in vulnerability, deeply rooted in vulnerability. Um, and as such, when we take a look um, at the topic of stress, anxiety, depression, suicide, culturally, as a culture, as a society, it's so heavily frowned upon. But this is why it is so important that we have these discussions here today. This is why it is so important that we start to have these discussions in the educational space. This is why it's important that we take a look at the different facets of our society, different organizations that contribute to the social learning um, and culture um, of our world um, to reconsider negative emotions, to reconsider the talk of negative emotions, the talk of stress, anxiety, and depression, because just be, we, we're not talking about it and we see these numbers escalating. It's, it's real. Whether you want to talk about it or not, it's very real. The numbers don't lie, right? So one way or the other, we have to find ways to talk about these issues. As parents, we have to be able to engage in conversations you know, about their, the, the level of stress, the level of anxiety, you know, depression. It is a part, that's it's just the thing. We can't cover it up and pretend like it's not there. It's a natural part of the human experience. So the question is, how do we talk about these issues? How do we create and develop um, support systems and structures in place that can help um, motivate these conversations? Just to follow up in, in terms of that question, um, do you think that we talk about emotions enough or that parents are able to talk about emotions enough? Like, I mean, we're talking about mental health and really the crux of it is mm -hmm. talking about emotions. And in some cases, like even within, oh, I hate to say this, like masculinity and all so forth, there's so many things at play where sometimes it's hard for us to describe a certain feeling and it just shows up as anger or something else, right? Or some other behavior. So, I mean, do you have any, well, one thoughts or recommendations about how to address just actually talking about emotions? Yes, absolutely. Um, first and foremost, there is, we know a cultural stigma when we're talking about emotions, particularly negative and more so for males than females. It is more acceptable that females talk about their emotions, but the truth of the, the matter is that doesn't mean males don't have emotions. They do. They're just having to suppress it because we live in a society where it's not as masculine to talk about our emotions, right? That is where that conversation has to change. 
that conversation has it. it. And again, it has so much to do with education. It has so much to do with awareness. And the question becomes, how are we implementing that in the different social organizations in our life and within our culture, right? To promote the talk of, you know, uh, the talk about emotions, negative emotions. How do we change that? And I think, you know, we're at the starting point right now. I'm starting now, you know, to see, I'm starting to see at least within the school system, I, uh, especially within um, the elementary uh, school system, I'm starting to see where they are now uh, focusing in more so uh, on emotions because we see suicide rates escalating and they're asking why, right? So if, I mean, that's one of the things, if we have to wait until suicides continue, uh, continue to escalate, I mean, who, who's going to be left? And, you know, we have to sit down and we have to talk about, we have to talk about emotions. And so this is another issue here too. If you take a look at the research on emotions, this has also been an area, as, 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 you know, I come up from the area of business and marketing. This has been an area that for the longest time, no one wants to touch. No one wants to touch it. Why? Because emotions is far harder to measure, right? Than objective, right? Ob objective construct, objective, um, objective variables, right? So much harder to, much harder to, research and so therefore people stay away from it so it honestly if i take a look back at the marketing literature it has only been within the last 20 years or so not even not even like i'm totally i'm totally giving them way more effort way more credit here but not even within the next you know within the last 20 years that is when uh we are starting to see more research being done on emotions and so much, I mean, right? So we're just now learning about emotions more so. Um, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're at the start of this. We're only at the tip of the iceberg here. Um, but these are conversations, once again, that's, that's why it's so important that we're here tonight and we're talking about these issues so that people will start to see that it is okay. It's okay to talk about your emotions. If anything, it is necessary, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Um, Mm -hmm. like, um, so I do have another question here that a lot of people voted for. What do you think about health and wellness apps? Do you think they are as effective as other actionable strategies? Health awesome. and wellness apps. Um, I would say, um, you know, from, I will talk about it from the research side. And then I will also talk about it from the industry side, because I do have a little bit of background in both. Um, from the research side, um, of course, it has been shown to work, but it depends upon what the objective, what the goal is, and also how effective that app is um, in helping the individual accomplish that goal. So it depends upon the health app that you are choosing, okay? Um, also from the research um, standpoint, more recent research is showing that health applications are, are or health and innovation together in general, okay? They are very cost-effective and they are, um, not only are they cost-effective, they're effective in a sense that it, it, they are trigger points. So we just talked about priming and salience, right? Nudging effects. So the health apps we see um, are effective in a sense that they are at the intersection of priming, they are the cues, right? The triggers that causes you to behave and it's relevant. And again, it's only as effective so long as it is consistent with whatever health goal it is that you have. Now, from the, um, from the, from, from the consulting side of my life, um, what I have seen is this as well. Health apps are becoming more and more effective, more and more effective in such a way um, where they are taking health and marketing and they're merging the two. So I'll just give you an example. Um, let's say you are a mom or dad and you're looking to purchase healthier foods, but you don't know how to go about that. There are, ha are apps that are now being created that basically takes all of the health information, categorizes them, ranks order them based upon the health objectives that you have. 
So when you when you actually scan, you know, the barcode, it actually then pulls up all of the competing brands, and then it will rank order them for you as to which brands, you know, um, aligns more consistently with your health goal, for example. So they are helpful um, depending upon the app and depending upon if it is consistent with what your with your with uh, your health goal is what I've seen so far. Okay, great. So we are on top of the hour and there are just a few more questions, but before we, you know, move on into anything else, um, I wanted to make sure that any, any of our students who are on, um, who need to go to class capture the CBA advantage. So we'll put up a slide just now so you can, um, you can scan your code for CBA Advantage, which is right up there now. Um, so while we're doing that, perhaps um, for those of you that can stay, please do hang out. And there is um, one more question from our Dean for Professor Bowie. Um, so we'll address that while people uh, scan their code. Um, Professor Bowie, do you think that the current marketing blitz from Big Pharma on meds that address depression and anxiety will begin changing culture or the conversation? Um, or the comfort level of those raising these these particular areas? Um, gosh, that's a fantastic question. Um, do I think that it will change the conversation or will it continue? I do think that it will change um, the discourse. I do. I do think that it will change the discourse because as we take a look at all the strategies that we talked about tonight, they are not ones um, that rely on psychotropic, right, uh, meds. Here, rather, they are, at the end of the day, like strategies. So I think that as we go to um, create a culture and an environment that allows folks to feel much more comfortable about talking about, you know, you know, much more comfortable talking about negative emotions, stress, anxiety, and depression that naturally will allow us uh, to segue into strategies that are our life learning strategies that um, can help mitigate uh, psychotropic use. Um, now that is, again, only in, in instances uh, where they are not obviously chronic conditions, right? Um, um, those types of conditions that um, are outside the realm um, uh, of the human, uh, at least of the general population and, and, and the human experience. But I do think that it will most certainly, um, if, if, that is, if we are able um, to get to a point when these conversations become normalized. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you, Professor Bowie, for talking to our attendees and our guests today. This was such a timely topic and such great information for everyone as we, you know, live through this pandemic. So for everyone else, again, thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Um, our Impact Insight webinar series will be taking a break for the holidays and to provide everyone with a well-deserved Zoom break. Um, we are so grateful for your attendance and engagement this fall semester. We will be back in January for spring. So for now, please do stay safe, healthy, and we will see you all very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.